Um, he's um, generously said he's prepared to take questions. So um, look, while you're all thinking of your question, um, I've got a question that I'd like to ask Trevor, and that is our last McElroy lecturer suggested we needed a coal-fired power station in Queensland. I know that's something that you've supported in the past, but I also know that this is a really fast-moving field and that sometimes the solution that looks good today doesn't look good tomorrow. Are you still in favour of a coal-fired power station? I've never been in favour of a coal-fired power station in North Queensland. <laughs> you can't build it big enough. And, and it, it's, the same as the, it's the same as the foreign investors milking, uh, milking government handouts under the premise of being a power developer. And, and the headline a, a week and a half ago that, that what's wrong with Australian energy policy? You've got 5,000 megawatts of solar in North Queensland that's only got 300 megawatts to get to the load. Well, what, what do they know? That's, it's, and, and so it brought up the quote of uh, these people who, don't, who didn't realise that you had to get power from Timbuktu uh, to, to, to the city centres. Um, but but, coal -fired power, but, but we, we can't afford to close any coal-fired power stations. There is a, there is a, a serious generation, 24-7 generation deficiency um, in, in, in the NEM, mainly as a result of the Hazelwood closure on top of a northern. And, uh, and, and it needs to be replaced by at least 1,000 megawatts in the Trobe Valley. And, uh, and we're working on that. It's one of our ANGI, ANGI recommendations that may be in the second shot that when the bureaucrats get around to and scratch their heads, they might do something. There's only two and a half hour, years left of the Morrison government and uh, they better do something quick. The, 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 idea, the idea that, that um, Liddell can be replaced by nine and ten dollars a gigajoule gas in new in new power stations and a bit more sun and wind is ridiculous. Um, the 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 media and the boffins can talk about it all they like, but the people, as they showed at the last election, know that closing power stations puts the price up. It's done it twice already. It's going to do it a third time. And uh, and and, uh, and the Guardian is written in written in Trumps. My, my 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 advice, and that is that is the government should should um, retrospectively classify the Liddell site as a as as an exclusive generation development zone, baseload generation development zone, and uh, and if they can't keep it going until it's replaced with like for like, they should give it to someone else to do it. And by the way, throw in all their legacy rehabilitation costs, as we tried to do in South Australia as well. So so it is just so important. The, the, the use of old capital for as long as you could... We, we have a plan at Vale's Point to spend... to extend its life from 50 years, which it'll arrive at in 2029, for 20 years for 750 million. That's, that's, that's about 600... That's about 0.6 of a million a megawatt. It'll cost 2.5 million a megawatt to build it new. So it has to be cheaper to... to, to to actually replace it with, to actually extend its life. And that's, and that's the same at every power station. And if Liddell hadn't have been allowed to fall away um, so that it's supposedly irreparable, um, only to make more money, um, then, then it should have been in the same vote. So, so my, my uh, the, I mean, there's, there's no politics in this. It, 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 existing power stations should stay alive, should, should, should operate for as long as they can. Um, and CNI customers will only contract, you know, two or three years most into the future, and the idea of underwriting 70 or 60 percent of the of the cost, which is the, the the debt cost for the for the term, so you spread the debt cost over. Equity still takes its risk, and that should be done for for, for and, and and that was recommended by Rod Sims, who's hardly political, but he's certainly um, one of the most sound. Um, commentators on where electric energy should be going. Carol Oates over here. And then James Sheldon. Trevor, could you speak to the issue of uh, nuclear power waste disposal, please? I, I can't speak to that except that that um, the, the, our, our premise here is that 
that has to be accounted for properly. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, I, I know that we, we have had a new scale who, who are the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the floor owned and different investor owned company that is um, getting uh, compliance approvals from the Department of Energy in the United States for small modular reactors. In, in some ways, it's like putting um, submarine uh, nuclear plants on land. And it's not putting it in anyone's backyard. The, these are 70, 70, 75 megawatt units. And, and so you can put them at COPA, at the end of the transmission lines, um, in, in places where, 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 where the, the, you put three there or four there, um, and you can build them in units. Um, the, the, the cost that will have to be put up to bank the project will have to take account of the renewal of the of the um, uh, disposal costs when they eventually, but small modular reactors are, 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 are big enough to fit on a train to go on any U US highway railway. They're 90 foot long, manufactured in two halves. It's a largely sh shop manufactured unit that, that goes two thirds into the ground. It has only a 40 hectare imprint of any influence that has to be monitored and a much narrower, a much smaller scale of, of, um, of, of hard um, uh, ura um, you know, de de um, nuclear detection. But, but the, 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 the thing is that we shouldn't argue about whether it's economic. We should get rid of the law banning what is legal in nearly every other country in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. John, John. Yeah. Thank you, Trevor. I've known you for many years. I congratulate you on what you've achieved in this state, particularly as an ERM shareholder, <laughs> but as um, also chair of the Queensland Ballet for 11 years, I'd like to thank you for your philanthropic contribution to our ballet, which has been wonderful. For you. In one of my former professions, I'd like to ask you to elaborate a little more on what you were talking about in the electrical stimulation, as I understood you to say it, in medical application. Well, for, for a long time, people have known about, about um, light and sound and all of these things that, that, that can go good. But, but, but this, is, this has been researched by these founders for 25 years in academia and in commercial area in, in injury repair, of all, doing everything. And suddenly they've got this, they've got this minute um, printed light, light spots, red light that would go on a patch which, which sits on the arm. And um, it, it, the process is a, 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 a PBM, it's a, it's a photomodular photobiomodulation and and the these the my I have a 28 year old grandson one of my the oldest of my eight grandchildren who's a doctor of physiotherapy and and he is so excited um, about doing some of the about doing some of the studies it's a thing that will complement physiotherapy it won't be it doesn't it doesn't do what physiotherapy has to do exercise is the most important thing for pain but but keeping, but but keeping it warm, or, or and and the, the the science goes into the different impacts on different muscles, the different light wavelengths have. So light is an energy source, and it's just a different energy source to others. But uh, that's all I can say. It's uh, it, it's looking very good. It'll be our next billion dollar company, I hope. <laughs> when are you floating it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you don't. Uh, but, well, I, I don't want these 300 ASX analysts telling me how to run it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Trevor, here. Table here. I'm looking right. up at you guys as well. Over here, Trevor. Trevor, over here. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor, make rough, mate. How are you? Oh, hi. Mate, you've moved at a million miles an hour, and it's, it's great to see. Um, I just wonder whether you can uh, just elaborate on your, your view, and I think I agree with it, that, that you, we don't need a coal fire power station in, in northern Queensland for the reasons you stated. And of course, this 
this leads to this essential political problem where you've got politicians who take simple views and say, oh, I'm in favour of a coal fire power station and such and such, without having any idea about the complexity uh, of, of the economics of these things. So what, what uh, can you sort of walk, walk us through what we should be doing in North Queensland and, and, and what changes we need to make to sort of get people to think along the lines of, uh, this is the sort of power, power sources that we need. Can you, is that a reasonable question? Well, well, Go. well anywhere needs the cheapest electricity they can get. Um, they want the cleanest electricity they can get as well. But, but I mean, the, the, I mean, my climate change energy policy message is, is that you can't be doing both at the one time. Um, you, you, you don't have to believe in climate change um, to, 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 to believe that if climate change is real, um, then nuclear is the solution. That, I mean, that, that's just a, a, a truism. It's not political. It's, it's, it's not saying anything. Um, um, the, 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 the thing that Australia has to do is has to be proud and skite. Like every, I mean, every other country is talking the talk but not walking the walk. We're not only walking the walk, we've become the focus of, of, of every rat bag around the country wanting to distribute the wealth of, the wealth of nations um, and, and not, not for ungood reasons. We want to bring more people out of poverty in the world, um, but redistributing wealth by this sham of, of, of concentrating on Australia because we have the lousiest media on this subject out. When, 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 when Rod Sims um, gets, gets a space on the front page of the, of the business papers and, and the papers saying that, that businesses are outsourcing to, to, uh, to foreign imports at, at a rate of knots and, and, and outsourcing is the start of moving totally overseas. Um, every day there is another story about whether it's um, a blue scope investing a billion dollars, and Pratt spending spending money in the U.S. Well, wouldn't you if you could buy a cent and a half kilowatt hour power? And and the, these are the rea these are the realities. We are doing more with sun and wind, double what the rest of the world's doing. We are doing as much as Ireland is doing, which which is proof that you have to change the market to to introduce um, renewables. In, in a more managed way. I mean, one of the problems that, that, that we've recommended is that AMO, the market operator, I mean, it was set up nowhere in the world does a market operator do more than market operate. In Australia, it was, it was set up, well, in a different form, but the same thing in 1997. Um, in, 19, in 2005 or thereabouts, it, it was reformed as AMO, but it was also given a transmission network service provider role in Victoria. I mean, give me a break. It's the market operator and it's also a participant. And then it did, they thought it did such a good job there that in 2011 or something like that, they decided, well, it better be the national transmission planner. So we've got all these smart people all concentrating on what you can do without generating. I mean, they can dream up a different idea any day of the week. And um, whereas we need generation, we need cheap generation and, and North Queensland ought to be more worried about where it's getting its cheap generation from, not whether it's, uh, not whether it's, it's, it's local. Um, we can double the transmission lines or do whatever they like, but they want the cheapest power in the world to get the industry. That's my talking work. Last question to Larry. Oh, thank you, Travis. Thanks, Yangi. <laughs> yeah, just you direct a waving in front of your face right. for the last one minute. No, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. No, I clearly, I clearly <laughs> indicated that I was taking one over here, and I think a current party president beats a former premier. So. <laughs> <laughs> Stand on your chair next time. Maybe you can grab one in next time. Very nice. Um, look, Trevor, what I, and I've got a bit of a fan because I've got your speech beside me, but in one of the comments that you mentioned, and I'd be interested because you've talked about coal and, and potential power station in North Queensland, where you quote in your speech that um, pumped hydro 
in the flattest and driest continent in the world is not going to lead to um, appropriate energy. Now, the former Prime Minister oh. was, friend of yours, um, was uh, uh, a great proponent and what's happening now, which is Snow Hydro 2.0. Uh, we have the greatest drought that's affecting us for decades. Um, kind of ironic that we're going to bank the history of power generation on the next hydro scheme. What are your thoughts there? Well, um, a 2,000 megawatt power station um, needs 6,000 megawatts of sun and wind, which is which is the, the equivalent of a third of the time, to be the energy that it wants to base load. And it has to put 4,000 megawatts of that up at, and back down at, at an 80% efficiency. Um, it'll be built all over the world at a subsidy. It's got to be subsidised to get from tim the various Timbuktu's to, to the Snowy and subsidised to go back. And uh, these costs are, 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 are out there. Their, their, their numbers are nearly $5 billion for the civil works and, and machinery works at, at Snowy 2 about four billion dollars for the transmission costs and and you need you need if for six thousand megawatts of sun and wind you need at least six billion if not it's, it's, you're not going to get it for a dollar a watt you're going to get it for about a dollar fifty a watt so it's about nine billion nine billion plus nine billion is eighteen billion dollars to have two thousand megawatts of baseload power which you could supply for five billion with a coal-fired power station selling power at seventy five dollars a megawatt hour or, or, or you could keep the power stations going for a fifth of that for 20 years. I mean, th these are no-brainer things. I, 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 I had a quote that uh, I've been 60 years in the energy industry and for 40 years it used to be such a pleasure. It was the greatest, I mean, I mean honestly, from 1960 to, 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 to from 1959 when I graduated to... Um, um, to 89, it was just the greatest evolution in efficient electricity supply across Australia and the creation of industry. And uh, and they used to say that it was great that energy wasn't anywhere near politics. And and now it's come over and it's so complicated that, that everyone knows a little bit of the big, the big complex issue and it's nearly impossible to have a discussion about it and all too often it becomes whether you're supporting what the Labor Minister, I mean, and politicians, I mean, I, I think, I think <laughs> Mikel has said that um, he didn't presume to know about electricity, he just asked people who knew what they're talking about and uh, successful energy ministers have done that, unsuccessful energy ministers will, will will preach like one does it's still today on both sides, we're going to have net zero emissions by 2050. If, if you know what, if you can even work out what net zero emissions means, I don't think it means anything, but, but 2050 is nine elections away. It, it's, it's, the perfect, it's the perfect political promise for someone who's not going to last in politics very long. <laughs> <laughs> You can have the last question, Campbell, seeing him I'm standing on three copies of the yellow pages. I have to send them out to get them. They're hard to find these days. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, uh, Trevor, just to, firstly, you, you've dealt with AMO uh, because that's a shocker. So he took that question away. And if I can just comment about uh, Snowy 2, what gets missed all the time, and it's the same thing about building these dams in the north, it ain't going to happen because of the Federal Environmental Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1997 till they work out that that's a problem. But I'll move on. I was going to be on a more positive note. I'd love to have an electric vehicle in my family. I'm going to keep my diesel guzzling four-wheel drive Jeep because I love it so much and that's what I need to go off-road. But Lisa's got a Yaris shopping skate and it's 17, cost $17,000 to put on the road about 18 months ago. How soon do you think it will be before uh, EVs come down to that sort of level, given you're making predictions this evening as well? Look, um, there, there are 60 new models coming on the market this year, 60 new electric vehicle models worldwide. Whether they will come on the, the market in Australia would be a matter of whether or not we built the infrastructure. 
and the government's not building it, and uh, I don't think they should, but, but EV Power is building it, and uh, we're buying it from another company I own. Um, uh, um, <laughs> well, I, I, I partly own. But, but, but we, don't, we don't have to government subsidise it, because in the EU, they have passed laws now to, to um, and, and, and there's a table, um, I, I think there's a table in the handout on your table, of, of the fee for, for, for the, the total fleet of cars manufactured in Europe in the, in, from the near future, of what they'll pay for having emissions above 0.9 grams per something or other, 0.9 grams per whatever, um, uh, per hour. And, and one of the quotes we can do is that, is that for VW's fleet of three and a half million cars manufactured a year, it would be two, more than two and a half thousand euro per car. And the total for its three and a half million would be nine billion euro extra costs for manufacturing internal combustion cars by VW, and they are not producing any more. The, the, the Volvo announced no more internal combustion engines. I think there's been an announcement just this week um, with, Christ, um, with not another German manufacturer. But, but, electric, but internal combustion engines are dead. Why are they dead? Because public health is driving this in America. Greenhouse emissions and getting to net zero emissions is driving it in Europe, but it's happening everywhere. So Australia, um, as I recommend on energy policy, is, is talk the talk and walk the walk as much as it's worth it to us to walk the walk. And, and that is to take advantage of what they're doing overseas, don't try to precede them. And of course, that was, um, that was um, the Labour Party's problem. They, they, they predicted that half the new cars by 2030 would be, um, half the new cars by 2030 would be EVs, which is, which is not a very big take-up. That, that, that is at the low range of expected take-ups that are being accelerated now as we look at what's happening in Europe. Um, but they unfortunately said, and because we're going to do what Europe's doing, we're going to legislate against emissions. Well, you don't have to do that. It's going to happen anyway. You've just got a budget for it. Well, thank you very much, Trevor. <laughs> well, don't go anywhere. I, I, I'm now going to ask Darren de Bortoli to um, move the vote of thanks to Trevor. So just somewhere sort of central there. Um, before I move the uh, motion of thanks to Trevor, it's, uh, I'm just looking at this, around this room and I just think, what a golden opportunity to push one of my pet causes. And, uh, and oh, besides the Murray-Darling Basin, but I'm winning that one. And uh, if you come on Friday, well, I'll talk about that. But the other one is climate change. Now, there's two models proposed, anthropogenic climate change, and you've got the solar activity, but there is actually a third model that's never talked about. And that is, you know, it's obvious, gravity. And when you start looking at the science, why the Earth hasn't cooled in four and a half billion years substantially, it's, it's gravitational variability that's driving that. And if you want a good example of that, look at Jupiter's moon, Io, which is the most volcanic activity planet in the solar system. And then you look at the science. The Earth has mysteriously slowed down. The scientists can't explain that. 2002, NASA talking about the increasing equatorial bulge. Interestingly, that's sort of disappeared. Magnetic fields weakening. North Pole's going all over the place. So what I would like to see before I go on about this is, can we just have a bit of money being spent in this area of research? Because there's absolutely zip being spent in this area. And it makes perfect sense. That is the mechanism because it explains all the science. Same with oceans warming rapidly, oceans warming at depth, not at the te uh, top 10 metres. These are all scientific papers. The actual one about the top 10 metres not, not warming is actually a, a model used by the Anthropogenic Climate Change Camp trying to explain where the heat's been going since 1998. You know, it, it's so bloody logical. I can't believe that people are missing the obvious. 
And then after that, I'd like to congratulate Trevor. <laughs> and I hopefully haven't taken, but he's obviously, being an engineer, he's probably on the, um, on the spectrum. So, and it's quite obvious I'm on the spectrum as well because I can't let go of these subjects. And, uh, but, you know, and I think it's your contribution to sensible, uh, sensible um, government policy. And, you know, really, it's the policy is so dysfunctional in Australia. We talked about Snowy Hydro. Snowy Hydro, this is classic. Lake Eukenbeam was now allowed to get over 60% during the floods of 2011, 12 and 16. And why? Because the business model of Snowy Hydro, with the largest down the system at 4,400 gigalitres, not allowed to get over 60% was because they wanted to increase the price of power for the return back to the New South Wales government, being the primary asset. This is how dysfunctional water and energy policy in this country is. But on that, remember, in vino veritas, in wine is truth. And on that basis, I'd like to thank Trevor for his very informative and his sensible contribution to energy policy in Australia.